At one time, there was a federal credit union in Brooklyn, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. It was an important part of the economic interest of that community for over 40 years. How important? In a New York Times article dated October 28, 1970, Paragon was referred to as the nation's largest black credit union with interests and assets of more than 5 million and a membership of 10,000. In actuality, Paragon was the largest credit union in the nation, period. In an August 1967 article, the National Credit Union magazine stated that the credit union members were active in such local service organizations as the Urban League, the Industrial Home for the Blind, the Central Brooklyn Coordinating Council, and the NAACP, and they were also instrumental in the organization of a Chamber of Commerce for the bedford Stuyvesant area. In 1966, the borough president of Brooklyn, Abe Stark, proclaimed April 23rd Paragon Progressive Federal Credit Union Day, the day that Paragon moved into its new larger quarters at 1477-71 Fulton Street. Deputy Borough President John Hayes presented Credit Union President Wilfred Kerr with the proclamation. Today, this is 1471-1477 Fulton Street. On November 8, 1975, Paragon held its 38th anniversary dance. The Duke Ellington Orchestra provided the music. On August 10, 1964, Paragon received a telegram from President Lyndon B. Johnson addressed to Credit Union President Wilfred Kerr that read in part, I would appreciate it if you could join me for a reception at the White House, 4.30 p.m. August 20, an exchange of views with you and other outstanding leaders of our country is, I believe, important and desirable. Mr. Kerr accepted. In 1966, Shirley Chisholm, a Paragon member, meets briefly with Credit Union President Clyde Atwell prior to the annual meeting of the Bedford-Stuyvesant Real Estate Board. In an undated photograph, actress Ruby D speaks at a Paragon Community Educational Meeting. October 31, 1954, Clyde Atwell represented Paragon at a reception for William Tubman, President of the Republic of Liberia, at the Waldorf Astoria. Ms. Cecilia Horn, a registered nurse residing in the Bronx, is welcomed into membership on May 11, 1969, as Paragon's 18,000th member. On January 25, 1953, Dr. Yosef Benjakanen was the principal speaker at the Credit Union annual meeting and was thanked by Director Dr. St. Clair Critchlow. Where did all of this begin? In June of 1939, Clarence Medford visited a friend, Rufus Murray, a real estate broker, at his office located at 385 Tompkins Avenue. Their conversation was the same that was on the lips of many in the community and in similar communities across the country. America was in the aftermath of the Great Depression. The poor, as always, suffered the worst. No work, no food, no credit. Mr. Medford, who worked for the city, IRT, mentioned that he belonged to its credit union. They agreed that the way to solve some of the problems in the community might be to start a credit union. A credit union is a cooperative in which the members pool their money, called shares, and lend it to each other. A credit union charter could only be secured by an organization with a potential membership, such as churches and other group establishments. It was therefore necessary to create an organization that would satisfy the federal guidelines. Business and progressively minded men were approached on the subject. Mr. Rupert Jamart of Warner and Jamart Real Estate was approached and they offered their office as a meeting place. On July 18, 1939, a meeting was called. On that date, the Prudence Progressive Community Association was born, later to be named Paragon. And it was attended by Lloyd Wilson, Martin Clark, Rupert Jamat, Vice President, Dr. St. Clair Critchlow, Treasurer, Louis J. Warner, F. Levi Lord, Chairman of the Educational Committee, William N. Secretary, and Clarence Medford, Chairman of the Board of Trustees. 
they collected a total of $2.25 to purchase books and supplies. This was the beginning of a self-help organization that would funnel millions of dollars to thousands of people. Building membership was a tremendous task. Application was made for a charter, but there was not enough of a membership, and they were turned down. The men, their families and friends and volunteers knocked on doors, rang doorbells, and talked to people in the street. They besieged them to join the organization. Membership increased to 150. With $300 and much ingenuity, they bought their first building at 436 Tompkins Avenue. Application was again made for a credit union charter. January 16, 1941 was the date given for a review by a representative of the Farm Credit Administration. It rained, hailed, and snowed all day. Travel by foot or vehicle was almost impossible, but 62 people braved the weather and showed up at a meeting at the Elks Auditorium. The, represent the representative was impressed. On January 29, 1941, Paragon was issued Charter Number 4286. The credit union opened for business on February 24, 1941. Paragon grew and so did their needs. On October 17, 1953, the men of Paragon marched to their new offices at 1420 Fulton Street on the corner of Brooklyn Avenue. Today, it is a path mark. Once again, progress dictated expansion. Paragon built its new quarters at 1471-1477 Fulton Street and moved in on April 23rd. 1966. Early in the life of Paragon, a women's auxiliary was born, and their importance to the organization was immeasurable. They sponsored many fundraising activities, such as boat rides, dances, planned community educational meetings, served on several committees, and in general, kept the progressive in Paragon. The rumor that when a man wants something done, he asks a woman has much merit. There were many great individuals associated with Paragon, but one man was singled out for his exceptional contribution. That was F. Levi Lord, treasurer manager of the credit union from its inception to his retirement. He was the force behind the credit union. He helped structure the funding for the rebuilding of the Concord Baptist Church after it burned down in 1952. He helped formulate the birth of Carver Federal Savings and Loan Association. On several occasions, he was asked to run for public office but he felt his need was greater at Paragon. October 7, 1967 was the date that Paragon celebrated his retirement. A bronze bust of Mr. Lord was unveiled that had been sculpted by world-renowned artist John Roden. Mr. Lord's service to his people went far beyond Paragon. He joined the Marcus Garvey movement in the early 1920s and helped to organize the Brooklyn Division of the United Negro Improvement Association. He became its general secretary. He reported the Sunday night speeches of Garvey and wrote articles for the Negro World newspaper. He was the reporter for the first international convention of Negro people held in New York City in August 1920, which was attended by Negro delegates from around the world. He traveled the country speaking and raising funds for the Honorable Marcus Garvey. In 1921, Garvey sent him to Detroit to serve as, as its executive secretary and in 1924, he returned to New York to fill the position of Auditor General and then was appointed to the position of Chancellor. This position once again sent him traveling around the country for Garvey to promote the UNIA and raise funds. At a meeting in New York in 1983, Mr. Lord was interviewed about his role as former High Chancellor of the UNIA. His photograph was published in Garvey's Voice. UNIA's official newspaper. Pictured are Mr. Joseph Bailey, Counselor General, Alma Golden, Secretary General, Jean Slappy, her assistant, Mr. Lord, his daughter, Mrs. Barbara Carey, and Mr. James Spady. F. Levi Lord received many honors over his lifetime. This letter, dated January 23, 1968, informed him that he had been selected for enshrinement in the Brooklyn Hall of Fame. He accepted his award at a testimonial dinner held at the St. George Hotel 
on April 6, 1968, along with other distinguished Brooklynites. On August 17, 1987, the 100th anniversary celebration of Marcus Garvey's birthday, when Sumner Avenue was renamed Marcus Garvey Boulevard, Mr. Lord was invited by the committee to honor black heroes to accept a plaque for his service to Garvey and the UNIA. He was unable to attend because of poor health. Ironically, he was a resident of the Marcus Garvey Nursing Home in Brooklyn. I, his son, accepted an honorary plaque and commemorative street sign on his behalf. This presentation is only the tip of the iceberg concerning the Paragon story. There is much, much more. Clyde G. Atwell's book, A Passion to Survive, chronicles quite a bit of Paragon's history, but there is much, much more to be told, the latter struggles and misfortunes. The closing of the credit union despite massive efforts to keep it open is one of the great tragedies of our time, but that is another story for another time.